Suppose I have two medicines for you. One lowers your blood pressure, the other decreases your cholesterol levels. Sounds great, right? But would you still take them if I also told you they have no impact on your risk for heart attacks or overall mortality? This might seem like a silly question, but what we measure matters, and deciding what to measure is one of the more difficult problems facing autism design research, so it's important to understand and not be confused by the concept of surrogate markers. Blood pressure and cholesterol are what we call surrogate markers, and what are these? Think of them as stand-ins for what we really want to know. For example, imagine you are in a grocery store and you are looking for the shortest line. When you find it, you see me standing there holding a box of tissues and cough drops. You really don't want to wait in a long line, but you also don't want to catch a cold. Tissues and cough drops are all stand information telling you that I might have a cold. Yet these two items don't tell you if I really do have a cold. Perhaps I'm just picking them up for a friend. You see, good surrogate markers strongly correlate with the outcomes we really care about, such as heart attacks and overall mortality. But they have the advantage of being quicker and easier to measure. For the most part, blood pressure and cholesterol are strong and convenient surrogate markers for our real goal of reducing adverse cardiovascular events. And it is easier to take someone's blood pressure and draw labs for cholesterol than conducting long trials that wait around for people to have heart attacks. Yet it is possible to create drugs that improve your blood pressure and cholesterol levels, but because of either their side effect profiles or our scientific misunderstandings, the drugs have no effect on heart attack and mortality risk. The most well-known examples are atenolol for blood pressure and niacin for cholesterol. These drugs were approved based on improved surrogate markers, but later found to have little practical use. You simply die with better numbers. Likewise, we may be designing and spending a lot of resources on buildings that improve one aspect of autism, but do nothing for an individual's overall quality of life. For example, take an autism school that limits exterior views and eliminates acoustical noise. Perhaps the children really can better concentrate in that school over another. To test this, we can measure surrogate markers such as how long an individual can remain on task or how long it takes an individual to learn a skill such as using money. But what if these sensory sensitive interventions cause more barriers and limitations to integration and access to the wider community despite improvement in these surrogate markers? It is easy to imagine how this could be. By heightening the contrast between the sensory levels of the school and the general community, the transition may be far too challenging for some individuals to handle. Essentially, an individual's accessibility and enjoyment would be confined to the select few environments specifically designed for them. An individual's ability to access and pursue personal and social growth is much more difficult to measure than observing a child doing a task and timing how long he or she can stay on task. But as we have seen, the easier measure does not make it the right measure. So before we start waving research papers over our heads declaring we have the evidence of what autism design interventions work, we should pause and ask, what was measured? Was it a surrogate marker and it is the architectural equivalent to atenolol or niacin? Lastly, measuring improved quality of life is less concrete than something like a heart attack. This makes it more challenging to measure and to get a consensus on what constitutes an improved quality of life for individuals with autism. That will be the subject of a later video, but for now I hope you can more readily recognize surrogate markers and interpret them more cautiously.